thanks for setting the expectation so low there, Zoltan. I appreciate it. So, algorithms are kind of a big deal, it seems like, lately, huh? Machine learning seems to be getting into just about everything that we do and experience, both as consumers and increasingly as uh, in the products that we're designing. Uh, machine learning is the oxygen that's powering this whole emerging set of interactions that we're uh, experiencing now. You know, things like predictive interfaces and speech recognition, natural gesture, uh, augmented reality, all these sort of things that are coming our way now are made possible by all this sort of super-powered machine learning under the hood. It's certainly affecting the work that I'm doing and my client work. Uh, I run a small design studio called Big Medium in Brooklyn, New York. And our focus has always been on designing for what's next. And for the last decade or so, a lot of that has been focused on sort of pushing the frontiers of what's possible in mobile. But I felt that changing over the last year or two and finding more and more of my client projects and workshops and executive sessions focusing on what to do with the possibilities behind machine learning and this broad umbrella that we're labeling artificial intelligence. And so that's what I want to talk about today, is what's the role of design and user experience in this emerging role of the, of the algorithm, the world that we already find ourselves living with as consumers, um, using these products that are, that are powered by machine-generated content, machine-generated results and conclusions, and increasingly machine-generated interactions. You know, again, I mentioned there's sort of this whole host of, of things that we're uh, uh, starting to, to use that are powered by this stuff, the predictive interfaces, computer vision, speech, virtual reality, augmented reality, all this stuff. Again, computer-powered or, or machine-generated interactions which sort of puts, in some cases, some of the interactions that we have designed historically in the hands of machines that are not entirely in our control as designers. It's an unusual problem. Machine-generated interaction. Like those virtual assistants, the voice assistants. I hear those are sort of a big deal, right? Certainly Jack Donaghy thinks so. Jack Donaghy of the uh, American TV series 30 Rock. If you're not familiar with it, Alec Baldwin plays Jack Donaghy, a TV executive. And in this clip, he has a brilliant new idea. <laughs> This is the way a lot of technologies work, right? They kind of work, and yet they sort of stumble on just these mundane realities of everyday life or collisions with other technologies. One system inadvertently talking to another system. And so, you know, this, it sort of goes to this uh, 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 conflict that a lot of us feel, I think, both again as consumers and as designers, where technical advance gives way often to cynicism or, or disillusionment. That technical advance inflates expectations faster than it can fulfill them. And so we see the glimmer of possibility, but we stagger to find success. And so as designers and developers, we're constantly caught in this whipsaw swing between these two states. And so for designers and creators and developers like all of us in this room, the truth is that it takes you know, real time and patience and a willingness to experiment to find the right mix or context for the technology and, and what it's capable of at the moment. And so in other words, the fact that it doesn't quite work right right now doesn't mean, at least certainly as the people designing and making these things, that we should run away from these technologies. Instead, it, it needs more and more of our attention. It needs our help. We need to get in there, all of us, to start, to start working on this and improve these experiences. And I know what you're thinking, Josh, Josh, Josh. I'm a, I'm a designer. I'm a front-end developer. What do I know about machine learning? I'm not an algorithm engineer. I'm not a data scientist. And friends, this is not just the domain of engineers and data scientists, although largely they've been the ones sort of driving the, and empowering all of these changes for the last several years. Designers and product owners and front-end folks have to be involved in this. So what we're going to try to do over the next... 30, 35 minutes here. Let's try to go from here to here. Yeah, all right. I'm feeling pretty good about machine learning now. We all sort of have to sort of understand our role here, and that's what I want to talk about today, is the roles and responsibilities, particularly of design in this machine learning world. Because the design and presentation of data, it turns out, is as important as the underlying algorithm. And getting this right is critical, and it turns out, and I'll show you sort of a bunch of examples 
uh, that show this of just how hard it is. Uh, so my work has begun to turn to helping companies sort out the responsible and respectful presentation of data-driven interfaces, and I suspect that yours will too soon, if not already. So what does that mean for us? Well, that's what we're going to experiment today, and I'm going to do this sort of in four chapters. One, I want to look at how all of you here can dip your toe into working with machine learning, like today, with tools that are available to you, accessible to you uh, right now. Uh, I want to look at also at the design and presentation of machine-generated results. And then we're going to look at data bias and how we might improve the data that feeds our models to eliminate bias and the role particularly of design and UX in that. And looking at responsible tactics for gathering training data. We'll wrap up with that. So I'm going to share some techniques. I'm going to share some design principles. And we're even going to talk a little bit about some goddamn social justice. You with me? Yeah? All right. OK, all right. Well, then let's get started with that first thing. Let's talk a little bit about experiments. How can we get started working with this stuff if we do not have formal sort of machine learning training? Well, it turns out that Google and Microsoft and Amazon and IBM, at the same time that they are all competing to create new breakthroughs in machine learning and artificial intelligence, they're also in a race to give it all away. Uh, Intelligence as a service, intelligence as a utility. So machine learning services and APIs are becoming a commodity, at least certain classes of them, just like server hosting. And in fact, it's often given away for free as part of a hosting package. So one example uh, to look at here is Microsoft's cognitive services. So if you use Microsoft's Azure web hosting, you get access to these APIs. And in fact, you're, you can pretty much prototype and experiment with them for free. Amazon and Google and IBM all have similar offerings, basically free to experiment. And Microsoft in particular, I've found, is a, a great place to play because they have a lot of services, ready to roll and easy to use. So just to zoom in on one of them uh, as an example, the emotion API, you guys. You can outsource all of your emotional needs to Microsoft, which of course is totally on brand for Microsoft. They've understood emotion since way back. You remember this? <laughs> Old gold, just never, just never gets old. We're gonna miss you, Steve. All right, so let's look at a little bit, actually, at, at what this Emotion API does. It, it, you give it a, an image, and it identifies faces and reads their emotion, and it, 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 it then categorizes them by the eight stages of emotion that we've all felt about Microsoft at one time or another. Uh, so this guy here on the left, you can see that he's generally happy with some neutral and some subtle notes of disgust and sadness. <laughs> So it's basically stock photography in a nutshell, I think. So well done, Microsoft Emotion API. You've nailed it. But look how easy it is to use. You feed the service an image, and you get back this highly structured data uh, that you can sort of easily incorporate into, uh, into an, an interface. And there's just tons of different things like this that, that, that report like all of these different sort of data and results in really sort of easy to digest ways for a, in a, in a web-friendly format, in this case in JSON. So services like this give you this playground. They're ready for you to use right now. I encourage you to explore them and, and, and see what, what they can do. Because essentially, you know, it's like you're getting all of these companies' machine learning superpowers effectively for free, at least for prototyping. And, and getting a sense of the, the texture of this is something that we did in the workshop uh, yesterday as we sort of looked at how to work with the UI and UX of machine learning is getting a sense of the texture of the data that comes back. So I encourage you to dip your toe into these and make some simple applications or prototypes. Start playing, start splashing in puddles a little bit. So basically, if you use those services, you get immediate access to all of this stuff. You know, speech recognition, speech synthesis, computer vision, natural language, translation across languages, data analytics, all kinds of goodies. I think the best stuff, as always, though, happens when you mix and match. 
You know, so you could use camera vision to identify an object with your phone, get sort of the, the identification there, translate that word into Japanese, send it over to a speech synthesizer service to speak that word in Japanese, and now you've turned the whole world into living flashcards for, for translation or for learning another language. Right? Sort of like there's all these opportunities for very quickly spinning these things out. So here's another example of sort of chaining those uh, APIs together. Giorgio Cam is a web-based project from a pair of Google developers, and it's all Java JavaScript in these back-end services. So they combine camera vision and speech synthesis and the web audio API to make a sentient rapping robot. Are you curious? All right, let's take a look. What if the computer turned the things that it saw into lyrics of a song? It could even rhyme about them. We've got glasses in this spot. Could be I wear, but maybe not. We've got glasses in this spot. Pop, pop, pop. We had our friends try it out, and they had a lot of fun pointing it at all kinds of things. Is that food I see? I see, 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 see. It's pretty close. Plan to me. That's block string instruments on my screen. Screen, screen. Could be profession, but maybe not. No, no. Looks like world to me. Me, me. Digging that camera operator you've got. Digging, oh. got, got. <laughs> Digging that camera operator you've got. It's a lyric that will go down for the ages. I'm, I'm sure of it. So look, this is just sort of silly fun, but what a great way to sort of try to experiment with what these uh, uh, APIs can do and what they're capable of. And again, just working in a mobile browser here. You know, this is a web-based project where the camera identifies the object and makes a song about it. Capture the image with WebRTC. Recognize that image with the cloud, with Google's Cloud Vision API. Labels are dropped into a rhyming template to create the phrase to speak. Get the audio of that phrase. The the client makes a request to a text to speech API. It's all happening just you know it's just being rooted through JavaScript effectively. The app itself doing very little. It's kind of remarkable. So get out there and play. My point here is you don't have to be a data scientist to start working with this stuff and using machine learning as a design material. You don't have to be the one to build or create algorithms. Even your organization doesn't have to, at least to start experimenting with this stuff and finding a role for it in the kind of work that you do. So instead, think of the algorithms like this. As I said, machine learning is a design material. And like any other technology or design element, this design material has some special considerations. And as you work with machine learning, you'll learn that presenting machine-generated results does require some nuance. And that's for a simple reason, not to put too fine a point on it, but the machines screw up a lot too. Or at least they have interesting interpretations of the world, maybe we can say it that way. Uh, the world is a complicated place. It's full of subtlety. And so even when speech recognition is accurate, the speech is translated into the right words, what to do with those words often remains hard. What's the intent or meaning? And there's context, too. Uh, does Alexa understand who's speaking and whether that matters? The device isn't aware that it's a child versus a parent. Which is exactly what happened today during our morning show when Jim and Linda were talking about a child who accidentally bought a dollhouse and four pounds of cookies. I love the little girls take on it. Alexa ordered me a dollhouse. As soon as Jim said that, viewers all over San Diego started complaining their Echo devices had tried to order dollhouses. So again, it's Jack Donaghy's problem all over again, right? The TV talking to the device. South Park's, whoops, South Park's season premiere uh, this past fall was full of characters talking to Alexa and Siri and Google Home in typically off-color ways for the show. Alexa, Simon says I got to take a stinky poop. I got to take a stinky poop. Now, the real joke, of course, was on the audience, because if you had Alexa or Siri or Google Home in your house, it also followed the commands. And so your Alexa suddenly had a potty mouth, and your shopping list turned a little bit perverse. Right? Yeah. So here again, the machines couldn't tell the difference that it was the TV talking. 
Who speaks and what's the intention? That's a data science challenge, but designers have a role here too because there's a lot of nuance that the machines will miss, and part of our job is to sort of help to corral those misunderstandings and keep the experience on the rails. So for example, how can our computer vision algorithms hope, possibly hope, to manage this impossible situation? Right? <laughs> It's hard work. And friends, I'm sorry about this, because I'm going to sort of show you another challenging image, but this is the kind of sacrifice that we have to make as designers and developers in this era. <laughs> I know. I know this hurts. We have to make these kinds of sacrifices. Image recognition is hard work. Nobody knows that hard work more than Pick Desk Bot. This is a Twitter bot that feeds random images to Microsoft's Camera Vision API and publishes the description it gets for each image. It's, it's often pretty good. Like, this is a complex image, and it's sort of nailing it with the description there. It doesn't always get things exactly right. It's kind of charming and weird <laughs> when it gets confused. You may be familiar with Samsung's latest model here. They're just getting bigger and bigger. They're just getting bigger and bigger. Again, sort of disarmingly naive about what it can't <laughs> understand. Right. So this is, I think, becoming our work. Uh, it's the job for all of us who use these systems. The machines are weird. They see and understand the world sort of through this cracked looking glass. So the more that I work with machine-generated content, machine-generated conclusions, and especially machine-generated interactions, the more I move from designing fixed paths through data and content that's under my control to simply trying to anticipate all the weird crap that the machines come up with. Right? Which means that the job is less about designing the happy path for success and more about designing for failure and uncertainty. This is the real challenge, designing to anticipate a fuzzy range of results and uncertain confidence. You know, our job really is now to, to set expectations and channel behavior in ways that are appropriate to the abilities of the system. And this is always sort of true of our job as designers and developers. But it's especially true here, where we're not in control of the content and the results in the same way. We have to sort of do a better job of setting expectations for what the system can do and nudging that behavior in appropriate direction. So how do we do that? Well, I want to take that then into the, the second part of this presentation, which is looking at data presentation. And particularly, how do we deal with the uncertain results that we might get back? Um, the drive to give a, a definitive answer or conclusion very quickly characterizes a lot of machine learning products, for better and for worse. Unfortunately, definitive answers can be elusive in a whole lot of domains, and that has some unintended consequences that are a lot more serious than mislabeling a, a dinosaur as a, as a surfer. So let's talk about Google's featured snippets. Featured snippets are these text passages that sometimes show up in a box above the search results. You know what I'm talking about. It's an example like this. It's when Google is super confident about the answer. Right? We've figured out not only the right page, but the exact sentence on the internet that answers your query. So this is, I feel lucky on steroids. right? And, it, you know, and it's pretty good. Studies show that the accuracy rate of these things is over 97%, which is fine most of the time uh, until it's not. So for example, uh, if you search why are fire trucks red, the snippet that you get back explains that fire trucks are red because they have eight wheels and four people on them, and four plus eight makes 12, and there are 12 inches in a foot, and one foot is a ruler, and Queen Elizabeth is a ruler. It makes no sense, right? It's a children's nonsense story. But this is Google's definitive answer of why fire trucks are red. And all of us have run into examples like this. Of course, when you sort of go into, into more uh, contentious topics, maybe areas of politics, back when uh, Obama was president of the US, if you asked, is Obama planning martial law, Google would say, yes, Google is plan Obama is planning martial law. Uh, more recently, uh, if you started typing, did Trump, Google rushes in to finish the sentence, commit treason, yes. It's not even your question. Google suggests the question, did Trump commit treason, and then gives its controversial answer. You know, uh, 
proposing its own question and offering its own sort of very debatable answer. So there are far worse examples, too. Uh, uh, one of the things, too, that's a little bit dangerous about these is that Google Home, Google Assistant, uses these snippets as answers because it's sort of a, it makes sense for the format, right? It's like search results are not a great result if you ask uh, a device a question, a speech device a question. So it uses the snippet as an answer, those handful of, of sentences. And so until about a year ago, when Google intervened to, to sort of remove this particular answer, if you asked, OK, Google, are women evil? Google Home would respond, yes, with a 30-second explanation of exactly why. And I don't want to put this out there without first really being clear about this, you guys. Women are not evil. <laughs> All right? That is not the correct answer. But what a disturbing thing that that's in there. And part of it has to do with how you ask the question. The way you ask the question determines the answer. Ask if reptiles are good pets, you'll get an answer about why they're good pets. Ask if they're bad pets, you'll get an answer about why they're bad pets. It's the same question, ask different ways, and so you get different answers. So what I'm getting at here is that our answer machines, the Googles and Siri of the world, have an overconfidence problem. This is not only a data science problem of the algorithm returning problematic or controversial conclusions. It's that the presentation suggests that there's just one answer. The interface suggests a confidence that shouldn't exist. This is a design problem. This is a matter of presentation and messaging and setting expectations. So here's a very hard question that we have to confront as we learn to present machine-generated content. How might we teach the machines some productive humility in how they answer questions? Or another way to put it, how do we create systems that are smart enough to know when they're not smart enough? I don't know is, a better, is, is better than a wrong answer, but I think I know can be useful too. Now let's take a look at that. Let's go back to our friend the dinosaur. So here the bot says flatly, got it. This is a dinosaur on top of a surfboard. And that sort of ridiculous confidence is kind of part of the charm of following this bot's adventures on Twitter. We're able to understand its error, of course, because we can see the picture and fill in the gaps with our human brains, our judgment. But what if we wanted to try to make it more understandable for people with a visual disability, for example, who, who don't have that context? Well, when you submit the image to Microsoft's Computer Vision API, you actually get back a good bit of information. And we start to see that its view of the image is more nuanced. So let's take a look. Uh, here we can see that the description, a dinosaur on top of a surfboard, has only a confidence of 0.25. Right? It's only 25% sure that this is actually correct. But it's 97% confident that it's a dinosaur. So now we've got a little bit more information that we can use as a, as a designer. How might we adapt our design to better reflect our actual confidence? Well, tweaking the language can help. So instead of a dinosaur on a surfboard, perhaps we qualify it. You know, it's a dinosaur maybe on a surfboard, right? I mean, this is how you would express uncertainty if you were talking it through as a person. It's like, I maybe this, right? How do we start to get that kind of body language and inflection in our UI? I mean, part of the thing we can actually show the actual confidence level, that sort of has mixed uptake, you'll see, in, in, in sort of user studies. People sort of gloss over those things. Some of these language adjustments can actually help. So we're getting there, but we could also reveal more of that nuance. We could show that we're really confident about dinosaur, but not so much on the surfboard. You get the idea, and I'm kind of riffing here, but the, the, these are sort of things that we need to engage with more and start to show some of that, reveal some of that uncertainty, reveal some of that productive humility and honest interfaces. Uh, essentially, you know, what I'm getting at is we re need this new kind of body language for expressing levels of certainty and uncertainty to give people cues for when some critical thinking should kick in, some, in, some evaluation or further uh, uh, exploration is needed. I want to turn to the third chapter here and take a, a look at the roles and responsibilities of the designers and UX folks in improving the underlying data and particularly coping with bias there. The quality of the models that we can make uh, is directly correlated to the quantity and quality of the training data that the software takes in, right? And it takes a lot of training data, huge, vast amounts of training data. Uh, and the thing about those 
those patterns, right, in, in these systems that we use is that the machines only know what we feed them. They can only learn what we show them. And so they extract patterns from the data that we reveal to them. And they sometimes don't always draw the conclusions that we expect. Uh, at best, these moments can be sort of charmingly naive. Here's how the robots understand human romance. Here's a set of machine-generated pickup lines built by a neural network trained with a few thousand pickup lines. You must be a Tringle, because you're the only thing here. And maybe, but also a little more charmingly, come on, you look like a thing, and I love you. <laughs> All right, robot love. I'm not sure that the machines totally understand us yet. I'm not sure that we totally understand them yet. We may never really understand what they look like, what we look like to them uh, from the other side. But the truth is there's no such thing as a good pickup line, right? They're all awful. So if you give the machine awful data, it gives awful results. They mirror the system that they're given. And I think it's worth remembering that machine learning is, is really best at figuring out what's normal from a data set and then predict or recommend the next normal thing or identify outliers. This is not normal. Things like for, for predicting crime or disease. So here's the thing, the data has to come from the deeply flawed world that we live in. And so to go back to garbage in, garbage out, what if the prevailing notion of normal is actually garbage? What if our machines learn from us our own bad or dubious choices? What if they absorb and reinforce existing inequalities or leave out entire categories of people? And sometimes these mistakes and biases are so subtle that we feel them more than see them outright. There was a, a study two years ago that found that Google's speech recognition has a gender bias. If you have, have, had a, ran, a random man and a random woman, there's a 70% chance that the transcript of their speech would be more accurate for the man. And it should be the reverse. We see it sort of, at least with humans, um, with human understanding, we tend to understand women better. Women overall tend to speak more clearly, more slowly, longer vowels, ideal for speech recognition. But not here. The experience for the woman looks like this, which really feels a lot like this. And what a metaphor for the technology industry right now. This is almost certainly a bad set of training data, skewing male. I'm sure these mistakes are not intentional or malicious, but the effect is malicious. And it underscores here that women are treated like an outlier instead of half the population, or maybe put in more crass economic terms, instead of the group that controls three quarters of household spending. So when the machines ignore us, do we even exist? Sometimes it feels that way. I wrote a haiku about it, you guys. Uh, but actually, you know, I wrote this about a, a week before I, uh, I, I, I saw a certain video, which I'll show you in a minute. I want to sort of say, though, it's like, you know, you sort of know this feeling, you know what I'm talking about. I will say that the faucets almost always work for me. In fact, I would say most things work for me. I am a straight, white, American, upper middle class, educated man. Almost everything cuts my way in ways that I have not entirely earned or, or deserve. It's not the case for everybody. Let's see how other people experience faucets. All right. So watch this. Black hand, nothing. Larry, go. Black hand, <laughs> nothing. Larry, go. <laughs> Racist mother six. How did that happen? Like, how did that, how does that allowed? You know, who tested this? I can tell you what kind of team probably built it. <laughs> Lots of examples like this. This is Richard Lee, a citizen of New Zealand, and this is the message he saw when he tried to renew his New Zealand passport. <laughs> the subject's eyes are closed. Bad or incomplete training data that blocks this citizen from getting a passport. And it, you know, it's like the, the, the point here is let's not codify the past. That's a phrase from data scientist Kathy O'Neill in her excellent book, Weapons of Math Destruction. 
On the surface, you'd think that removing humans from a situation might eliminate racism or stereotypes or any very human bias. But in fact, the risk is that we bake our bias, our past history, into the operating system itself. And so in the cases of predictive policing or sentencing algorithm, where the data, in the US at least, is so completely biased against black men, or hiring and promotion algorithms where the historical data is biased against women and people of color, that data bias codifies that ugly past. And so part of our work ahead of us is, so how do we, how do we address that? How do we impose a new bias that favors the world that we want? Uh, you might remember this sort of awful example from uh, uh, 2015, when Google started tagging photos of African-American users as gorillas. Uh, Google apologized for this instantly. The product lead clearly mortified. They took the necessary actions to get it fixed very quickly. That action was stop identifying gorillas. And so even still, you know, gorillas are not identified in this at all. Uh, this is not obviously a, a perfect fix. It's obviously a certain, it's certainly a lesser evil. But this is Google putting its thumb on the scale, right? imposing values on the algorithm. I think it's important to notice that addressing bias requires its own bias. You know, we, and we live in a very divided era where definitions of fairness and justice are hotly disputed, not shared by, by perfectly sort of rational and reasonable people. So I believe that we have to be a little bit comfortable sort of expressing that bias. Of course, the question is who gets to name that bias? Who gets to sort of say the world that we want? Is it giant corporations? Is it us as users? Is it us as designers? Where does that sit? I, I'm not sure that we have sort of great answers to that, but I think that there's sort of a, it's a discussion that we need to have and be explicit and intentional about the kind of world that we want and the kind of bias that we want to intentionally put into place. I mentioned before that algorithms tend to do their best at optimizing for normal, and our culture tends to look at the disenfranchised or underrepresented as outliers. We tend to think of them as aberrations from the normal. So what if we stop thinking about them as outliers and start thinking of them as part of the essential fabric of our culture? What if we bake in some new truths into the core data set that we gather? Now, your set may be different from mine, and that's part of the real hard challenge of this. But personally, I'd like to see these facts baked into our data. Oh, here's one. This is popular in the United States. Uh, our culture, you know, it's, it's, uh, there's sort of this idea sometimes that, that there's sort of a, a privileged class that is sort of almost immune from, from certain kinds of crimes. So I want to show you this tool that predicts block by block where white collar crimes will be committed. So it's trained on five decades of financial malfeasance. And look out, friends. Here are the most dangerous neighborhoods in New York City by white collar crime. So this is minority report for financial crime. Unlike typical predictive policing apps, which tend to criminalize poverty, this one sort of tends to criminalize wealth and also indexes high on white men. And the point here is that I'm saying here is not that we should suddenly replace all of our policing stuff with this new model, but just to point out that the perspective that we give to our algorithms changes the result that we get. And I think one of the, the questions is, how do we get consensus? Can we get consensus on what that perspective is, about the values embedded in there? Because all software is political. It always has the values of the creators in there. And so how can we at least be explicit and have a conversation about what those values should be? And sort of, so, so part of that is really reflected in how we gather the training data, and that's the sort of section that I want to end with here, is how do we gather data that accurately reflects the world that we want to serve or build? And how do we go about building that data? And again, you might not think that this is the work of a designer or of people who are building the interfaces for these systems, but I would disagree. I would actually say this is UX research at massive scale. Gathering a data set is UX research, hundreds of millions of data points to train the best algorithms. How do we make sure we're gathering that data from the appropriate mix of people, people who reflect our audience or who point the way to the world that we want to nurture, and then measuring and sharing the right things? Well, if we look at the core questions that go into that, you know, what's the real problem to solve? 
What data determines the answer to that problem? Who holds the data? Who are the people to serve? Those questions look a lot like UX questions, right? These are the questions a good design team answers. And now we just have to scale up those skills to an unprecedented level and guide the data scientists and partner with the algorithm engineers about where to point their, method, their weapons of math destruction. And we've already seen a, a bunch of examples of what happens when those questions aren't well answered, when there are blind spots in the data. So I think one of the things we need to do is to build design teams that are more diverse to help address those blind spots so that we can see them uh, and see sort of things that, that are affected by people outside of the bubble of the design team. And I'm not just talking about diversity of gender or ethnicity or age or class or any of these demographic considerations. I mean, let's go beyond the usual tech crowd. I love this quote from Genevieve, Genevieve Bell, the anthropologist formerly of Intel, who says, you know, we got to get poets and artists and anthropologists and art critics involved in this. We need every walk of life, every perspective in this. If machine learning is going to go so deep into the most fundamental systems of our culture and society, we need to get everyone from our culture and society involved in the design and plan of these systems. So there's who does the researching there. But I also want to talk a little bit about how we do the research. As I mentioned, everything has to do with the data that we feed the machines. Uh, so we need to create incentives for people to feed the machines the good stuff. But it's important to remember exactly what they're eating when we feed them. <laughs> right? The machines eat us. Right? We're, we're constantly giving them the stuff that we share voluntarily throughout the day, both online and off, and the stuff that's sort of passively or secretly observed without our knowledge. So as product owners, as designers, as developers, we need to be a little bit careful here. You know this old saw that if you're not paying for the service, you're not the customer, you're the product. Well, to that, I would also add you're also the training data. Right? Users of free services are the humans who will train the computers in order to build better products and services. You know, uh, Facebook has one of the best face recognition models in the world because they got millions and millions of people to do the work of tagging the photos and identifying what faces look like. Remember, you used to have to draw a picture around faces to tell it what a face is? And then it learned what faces are. And then you would just sort of identify who it is. And now it just knows who everybody is when you take a picture, right? Ten years ago, in 2007, Google launched Goog411. It was a free telephone directory search for local businesses. Uh, so I don't know if this is the case here, but a while back in the US, phone information cost money. It was, uh, it was a, a service that you had to use, and then the phone call itself uh, was a charge. In this case, you called the service, and a robot answered, and you told it via speech recognition the town and the business that you were looking for, and it connected your call all for free. But Google's interest wasn't really in that transaction. Marissa Meyer, who was at that time back at Google, uh, said that the reason we really did it was because we needed to build a great speech-to-text model. So we're actually creating one service with the purpose of feeding another, of getting a whole bunch of voices and dialects and sort of building their, uh, their, their, their competence at doing speech recognition. Google does this all the time, right? They have this just-in-case approach to data. Just grab as much as we can. We might find it useful later. Facebook uh, is notorious on this, of course. They're likewise listening and recording when you don't expect it. They record and save posts that you don't even send. So if you get home after work and you start typing something like this, and you're like, eh, maybe I should moderate that a little bit. You know, sort of change it to something like this. Facebook still knows about that original post. It's already been sent up to the server. It's part of your record, part of that psychographic profile that they build of you. And this is no great surprise, but it's worth underscoring that so much of the time, data that we think is under our control is not GDPR or not, right? even our most intimate communications. So I think really it's, it's incumbent on us as designers to make transparency a first order design principle, to signal our intention, reveal our action, say what's really happening, create an accurate mental model for users of what happens when they use this service. Signal that you're capturing information and make it really easy to find how it's used. Because I think more and more there's this unsettling question that all of us have as consumers. Who do the machines work for? 
This is becoming sort of more vexing, more fraught for us. Once upon a time, your home and the objects that you bought for it and your devices worked exclusively for you. Now they're listening and watching with motives that may not map completely to your own. Right? And so we have these kinds of questions where devices have interests that aren't necessarily shared by their owners. For the most part, though, it's not the machines that we have to worry about. It's the companies behind them, or really the intentions of people like us. Because somewhere along the way, we went from asking, is it good for users, to how can we sell their data at a profit? And sort of the, some of the unsettling notion that I'm sort of believing is that the genie is out of the bottle here. That all of the data that we share or volunteer or that is observed, it's just going to sort of become total. Total surveillance is inevitable. But what's not inevitable is what do we do with that, not just as makers, but as citizens? I mean, and really sort of be loyal. When I, I mean, really be loyal to the user. We talk a lot about user-centered design, but of course, we have to answer to the man, clients, stakeholders, shareholders. Design is a commercial process. The project has to serve its patron. But I urge you, as you serve business needs, to work hard to make those align with human needs, human rights, human dignity. And ask yourself, can I honestly say that the decisions I make are really in the user's best interest, of society's best interest? Take responsibility for these products that we're all de designing together. You are your bot. It operates with the values that you cook into it, with the data that you select from this infinite pile of data that we're gathering constantly. So with any emerging technology, it's important just to keep reviewing, is this working the way we want it to? Does it align with my values? Does it create the world that I want? You know, if we don't decide that for ourselves, the technology will decide for us. So I just think it's really important to be intentional about this. The future should not be self-driving. Let's be intentional about the values that we want these systems to be embedded with and the results that we want them to have. Let's be honest with ourselves about perhaps some of the negative effects they can have too. So for the people who do what I do, what we all do, let's be intentional about how we build these things. We have the chance, I'm really optimistic about this, to make something really amazing because these technologies are enormously powerful. Abilities to get new insights that are not visible to us without these kinds of tools. Really powerful opportunities, amazing time. And so please go and make amazing things. If you're interested in more on this, I'd recommend looking at mindfultechnology.com, a site about creating products that focus attention instead of distract attention. uvetagenda.org, the result of a, uh, a retreat that I was part of last year of, of uh, artists and researchers and designers and science fiction writers about what our responsibilities and questions are for artificial intelligence. And my own site, bigmedium.com, where you can find articles that I write and more talks like this. The last thing that I'd like to say to all of you, though, is that you are a thing, and I love you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you, George. Uh, it was a really great talk. I think it was a really good, great uh, beginning of the conference. Thank you. Um, highly entertaining as well. I'm afraid we don't have a lot of time for questions, though. I think we can still take one or two. Anybody? Questions? I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there's a question there. Should I give my mic? I'm giving my mic. Hi, thanks for your talk. You. Um, that was really great. Yeah, thanks. You put up the quote by uh, Genevieve Bell, yeah. and where she where she says how how uh, how much it is an interdisciplinary effort. Uh, how much do you see that happen um, uh, in respect to the to the professions she put up, but also in respect to linguists, for example? Uh, how much is this happening in in the work you do? I would say very little, right? I think that we're seeing it happen very little. And, and in, including, I would say, this is a call to action for my own work, that I am still building products with fairly traditional design teams. But the more that I look at this, the more that I realize 
my own sort of gaps in knowledge. And so I think that part of the question is, how do we integrate these groups and at what time? It seems like they're like a, at the at different phases when we're sort of thinking about what the purpose, risks, and opportunities are for a project early on, it's a good time to have almost sort of a focus group of people involved in it. Part of the research, too, to sort of understand what audiences we need and, and considerations that there might not be, as well as evaluating early stages of the products. I just think that we need to get more people involved. And part of that is not just a matter of extending an invitation, but of also letting people know that they are they have valid viewpoints on these things. I think that there's sort of this um, broad uh, and shared uh, hallucination that only technology people will understand how to build this stuff properly. And I think that the last few years have shown that we have made some really important missteps. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that was it. I have to sign. Uh, I have to sign a contract to keep uh, the time slots. <laughs> Thank you. So, everyone. give it up again for.